All right, I guess we'll start. I don't know if we're allowed to start yet or not, but it's two minutes after, so. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Howard Hodder. I'm the GIS manager at HRG. I'm going to talk a little bit today um, about the infrastructure asset management and uh, data collection for Capital Region Water. Um, a little bit we're going to talk about today is kind of the process overview that we went through, a little bit of the project history in general. Um, basically, why did this project start? How it's been paid for to date and to be able to continue being paid for? Um, talk about the data collection in general, um, the different pieces of what's been done, uh, what was planned, how long it took. Um, I could probably spend an hour plus on each one of these topics, so I apologize if we kind of fly through it. Um, and feel free to ask me some questions either now or afterwards. I'd be more than glad to discuss it in a little bit further detail. Uh, and then, of course, you know, what type of hardware and software that we're going to be talking about. And then uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to be able to answer some questions. A um, little bit about HRG in general. Our office is based, our main office is based out of Harrisburg. Um, we're on 369 East Park Drive, right behind the, the Home Depot there. We've got eight offices uh, in and out of the state of Pennsylvania, one in Ohio and one in West Virginia. About 200 plus professionals. Um, and I'm specifically out of what we call our geomatics group, which is uh, our survey and GIS group. Um, we do a lot of different types of uh, non-traditional surveying and uh, traditional surveying. And uh, this would be a little bit of both. Kind of shows you an idea of what our expansion is. Um, we've done work pretty much in every state that touches Pennsylvania and then some. Uh, we've been to Kentucky, Indiana, Kansas, uh, Maryland, New Jersey, you name it. What do we do? We are primarily a civil engineering firm. Um, water, wastewater, storm water, um, some minor mechanical and structures. Uh, and then of course, like I said, uh, come out of the geomatics group. Uh, so specifically GIS and surveying, um, laser scanning, mobile scanning, those types of things. Uh, but we are a full service engineering firm. Uh, been around in this profession in this region for over 50 plus years now. A little bit about myself. Um, I've been with HRG for over 16 years. Um, I had an undergraduate degree from Bloomsburg University in geography and a master's degree from Penn State in GIS. Um, certified GISP have been for basically since it was its original conception. Um, and I have a lot of knowledge in utilities and GIS development in general. When I started at HRG, I was boots on the ground. I helped build the databases, I did the data collection, I did the analysis, and then I sold to the clients. I supported the clients, I did the marketing. Um, <laughs> you name it, I've pretty much done it. Now, luckily, um, I have people that help me do that now. So I don't have to do all the fun stuff anymore, unfortunately, but um, I get to come here and talk to you guys. So, uh, <coughs> A little, about, a little bit about me, uh, Matt Kucinci with HRG. I'm a senior project manager in our water and wastewater group. And specific to this project, I served as the project manager for this project itself. Uh, I do have a BS in civil engineering for VMI and have uh, over 12 years experience now in the, the water and wastewater field with both uh, municipal as well as private clients and I'm a professional engineer. Go ahead, Yuri. It's me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Yuri Evans. I'm with Capital Region Water. Um, I'm the newly appointed GIS manager. And uh, as, as Howard didn't say, you were going to say, we used to be the, the Harrisburg Authority, and now we're Capital Region Water. So with that, with that new name, we're in the midst of an exciting time of change um, and a lot of growth, and especially for me being the, the new GIS manager. For me, I, I spent 20 years in the GIS field. <clears throat> Most of that being in the Lancaster area, almost all of it. So uh, while Harrisburg is new to me, the, the industry is not. So just let me give you a little bit of information about Capital Region Water um, and who we are. With this new name, we're striving to become a uh, customer-focused and customer-driven responsive utility service provider in the capital area. Hence the name Capital Region Water. 
Uh, we, we are an operating municipal authority. We're governed by a volunteer board. And while we still are public, uh, we're separate from the city. And we operate separately. <coughs> so uh, we have, currently we have 85 employees and we're still growing. Uh, these employees manage the water, sewer, and stormwater systems throughout the city of Harrisburg and portions of uh, several of the neighboring municipalities, which you can see a few up there on the map. We operate 24-7, 365 days a week to provide these services to our customers. And did I mention we are growing? We currently have several job opportunities on the website, so if you're interested, uh, check us out, capitalregionwater.com. So that's, that's who I am and that's who we are, but you guys are here for the mapping. So I'll give you a brief rundown of what we have as far as the map goes, and then I'll turn it back over to you guys. In, on the map there, if you see the, the light blue shaded area, that's our water service area. We have over 200 miles of water pipe that transport the water from our reservoir to our treatment plant to our storage tanks, and ultimately to our customers. The green area, that's our sewer service area. We have a uh, combined system of stormwater sewer and sanitary sewer. We maintain over 134 miles of sewer pipe, uh, as well as 3,000 manholes and 3,500 inlets in the stormwater collection system. And just to complicate matters, we have a small portion of our sewer system, which is actually stormwater, and it's separate from the, the regular wastewater or sanitary sewer and combined system. So mapping of all these systems became a massive, multi-year, seven-phase project. Uh, the project was started in September of 2011. HRG was the chosen firm. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Howard and HRG. Thank you. As you can probably imagine, there's been a lot of fingers in this project over the years. A lot of players in a lot of different areas. Um, Calvary Region Water, obviously, being the main client, was THA at the time when it first started. Um, Esri is the, the platform, the GIS platform that was selected and is going to be used uh, for this entire project. We had firms. National firms, McKinnon Creek, C.M. Smith, GHD. Um, Army Corps Engineers has been involved. You mentioned the stormwater side. They're still involved, still working with us today. They probably will into the future. Um, Phillips Office Solutions, we throw that up there. What do they have to do with them? Everything very heavily on um, the billing side, the uh, document management side, and just the IT infrastructure in general. Um, they're the IT consultant. So they were played a heavy part as well because they had to develop. We assisted with the, the incorporation and development and implementation of their IT infrastructure for their, their GIS. Um, key for your global strategies, uh, talk a little bit more about them. Of course, you have the city, then you got your asset management systems, and then Matt will talk a little bit later about some of the underground infrastructure uh, investigation and some of the cool techniques that we'll be able to use for this project. Um, I could talk about this for two hours. I'm not going to bore you with this. But this is a basic process overview of what we look at whenever we start any project. Whether it be a very small project or a very large project just like CRW, the key is to understand where you're starting from. What's this project really going to be about? What are the players? Um, what's the outcome want to be? Um, designing that database to be able to do your data collection and be able to you know, convert the information into a usable format. And then, of course, select the applications on how you're going to consume that information. Implement it, and then obviously, continue to grow. With any GIS system, it never ends. Once you start it, it's just keep that ball rolling. And the amount of time and effort and money that's been pushed into this one, um, they're going to have one heck of a system as this thing moves forward. And you'll see as I go through today, a lot of these pieces were, were dis are going to be discussed, maybe not in this exact order, but these are the types of background that we had to have and had these discussions up front in order to understand kind of what that, that final outcome is going to be. Now, mind you, over two years, people change, staff changes, ideas change, technology changes. So 
So you have to be adaptable to be able to do and make those changes as things go on. So, where did we start? How many people lived around here around 2011? Anybody affected by the big 36 inch water line break out <laughs> behind the Harco project? Not the capital. That's where this started. Heber Gate. Anybody here? I wish the PGC was standing here with us right now. I've never seen it, and I'm an outdoorsman. But you ever see a beaver chew through a cast iron pipe? Well, supposedly that's what happened. Um, I believe what really came down to was the construction crews that were out there were just being bombarded with questions. And just to get the media off their um, job site, basically, and they said, yeah, beaver chew through the pipe. Well, that escalated into Beaver Gate as we know it today and uh, has caused obviously a lot of discussions and chuckles over the years. But this is really where this project came from. Um, up until then, you know, THA thought that they knew where the system was and what the condition it was until you hit a major waterline pipe and all of a sudden it shuts down the capital of Pennsylvania. Hmm, that could be a problem. Um, plus, you get people to take notice, which also helps you get funds to be able to fix things so it doesn't happen again. So, like a lot of GIS that I've dealt with over time, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, it takes a catastrophe like this for people to actually see the benefit of what we're trying to do. Um, boy, wish we had in place. Well, guess what? Now we're doing it and we're doing it right. So, again, like you said, plus or minus, depending on how you look at it. This is some of the original mapping that we started with to look from. A lot of the mapping that we looked at actually predated the American Civil War. Um, we had our hands on books that were literally hand calligraphy that were drawn the day the Battle of Gettysburg took place. And not only did we look at them and use them, so were the field guys. I mean, these are things that should have been under glass in a museum, but they're being used in the engineering group. Um, and this is no joke. This is the kind of stuff that we started from. And some of it very, very good, literally down to the number of bricks within a manhole or within a sewer line. Unbelievable. You'd never be able to build it today the way it was built in the past. But that's the kind of stuff that we started with. This map, if I had a printout of this, is about was it, 90 inches long by size so 40 inches wide. Table. Um, everything from hand drawn to little extras have been added over the years. We have a water system map and we have a sewer system map. Guess what? That water system map did not show that 36 inch water line. <laughs> um, so, okay, great, huge project. You know, Yuri mentioned a lot of it, you know, the, the size of pipes and the distance of pipes and the number of customers and the, just the geographic area in general. How are we going to pay for this? Um, HRG also has a financial services group that's been working with THA and now CRW for quite a few years on different funding projects for different things. And one of the things that we were able to help them with and work them with is uh, the PennVest grants. So as you can read this, I'm not going to read through it, but there's been certain bonds that have been um, worked with through us and with CRW to be able to help fund a lot of the project that has been going on. One of the things we're also working with, I mentioned the Army Corps of Engineers has a program called Section 22. That's a 50-50 match. So basically you're getting twice the amount of work for half the amount of cost, in theory. Um, and they're on the docket for that. Um, just to kind of give you a little quick jolt on that piece. This act, or Section 22 project, they hadn't taken any new applications for quite some time. Because of this project and the high priority of this project, they were able to be able to get on that list and be able to get that funding and be able to move forward with it um, in a much quicker process than people have done in the past. So we're very lucky to be able to get that pushed through with the Army Corps. Base map. Beyond the water and sewer, one of the things it's looking at is the stormwater systems. Everybody here has probably heard the wonderful words of MS4 and Chesapeake Bay, and runoffs, and I hate to say it, stormwater authorities, and charging for stormwater, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that we really didn't have for this region was a very strong basement. Um, we had imagery that was either county-based, 200 scale, PA map kind of thing, but we really didn't have good construction grade, really, it was all planning level kind of stuff. So we wanted to be able to build this GIS from the bottom up where we could have real high precision engineering grade, design grade style base mapping. So what you're seeing here is what the base mapping was set. Now obviously, there's more to it than just the city. You've got a dam out here at Dehart Dam that's about 23 miles away from here, which is the main water source for the city. 
we had to have the imagery and all the information for that, as well as the base mapping for green. Base mapping was created on the purple. The green was just orthophotography. Quarter inch pixel resolution, 50 scale mapping for everything in purple, all impervious surfaces. So now, not only can we have it just for a beautiful base map, we can use engineering, we can do design, we can do you name it. It's not planning, it's, it's, it's engineering grade. Everything else above, we've also got half inch pixel resolution. Huge data sets, but unbelievable data. So let's do it, let's do this right. This is what we originally started with for our DR dam transmission main. A little index map that kind of showed us where it was supposed to be, but nobody ever really knew where it was. Even the guys that were working in the city said, I know where some of the valves are, but we don't know where all the valves are. We kind of have an idea where the line is. It hasn't been cleared pretty much since it was put in. There are some markers out there, but boy, it would be nice to know where this is so that we can clear it, so we can maintain it, so that we can make sure that this doesn't fail. Because if this fails, that could be a major problem. So, it looks like a beautiful day up there. I think that was one of the three months of work that we did. Um, but you'll notice the USGS map. Unfortunately, we didn't see this until almost after we were done. But on the USGS map, if you go look, there's a little line that goes right through here. It says aqueduct on. Normally, USGS maps, you're not going to see lines like that. But that is an actual aqueduct line that was drawn back when the USGS was made. And you'll notice that. Hi, George, uh, that blue line follows it pretty darn good. <laughs> this blue line, it was all survey accurate. We had to traverse that entire line, conventional survey, to be able to find the locations. This was more of the conditions that we looked at on this line. Most of it was through the snow, for obvious reasons. We wanted leaves off the trees, accessibility, less undergrowth. Um, that is the right of way going down through there. It's a 50 foot right away. Can you see the right away? Um, you can see it was very cold. This was actually the bottom of this water bottle that was frozen out. You can actually see the, the stamp from that water bottle. That's how cold it was. Um, this was chainsaws and a lot of footwork to be able to get through this. Now mind you, it wasn't all 23 miles. It was about 17. Um, but it was, uh, it was a trek. What's the main made of and how did you guys trace it? We had it a uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more now. I'll talk a little bit about this. It's called SUE, Subsurface Utility Engineering. Um, it is a cast iron, I believe, in concrete. It's a concrete reinforced pipe. Um, it's a cast iron and concrete pipe. It's cast iron wrapped in concrete. And we had a sub consultant, we, I showed you, that came and created earlier. Um, competitively bid, came in and actually did what they call subsurface utility engineering on this line as well as the rest of the, the water system in the city. If anybody's been around town, you saw the little pink lines everywhere. We'll get to that, but that's where all the markouts were. So you'll see all these pink flags. These pink flags is what mark the lines, the center, uh, center line of that water transmission line. So let's get into the distribution area. Um, distribution area, basically, um, the base of the project, because of the size, we decided we split it in two areas. No political boundaries, nothing fancy. Literally, we took Camden Street and split it in half. That's about where it was. Uh, had nothing to do with anything but that. When you started looking at the counts, it was about 50-50. So we started in this area first where the transmission came in, and then moved up into area two, um, which became known as area one and area two for this project. Uh, the light blue line, this is uh, the secondary transmission line. Uh, so you've got your primary coming in from d -heart, and then this would be your backup line should you know, the, the primary ever fail. Um, one thing that I, I will touch base on as well before I move forward real too quick, along with the cross-country trek, we also had Norfolk Southern Railroad crossings that we had to deal with. Um, there was a lot of other involvement, multiple municipalities, so anytime we had to cut the road or trespass on different properties, we had to get the okay. So it wasn't just, okay, here's CRW's property, go ahead and do it. We had to deal with the city, we had to deal with Lone Paxton, we had to deal with Susquehanna. There was a lot of moving parts with this whole thing. And then you had other entities as well that all had to be coordinated through this. So um, it took quite a big effort. So how do we actually find the lines that are in the road? Um, when you go out in the street right now, you may see a fire hydrant, a mailbox, a fire hydrant, a curb stop, or even a water valve box that's in the street. 
So those are really the only indications that you have of, the, of your below grade facilities that you can view from the surface. So the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, back in the early 2000s, they published a guideline for uh, collection and depiction of existing subsurface utility data. And actually broke it out and defined it as a branch of engineering that is subsurface utility engineering to help them identify the locations and the quality of data regarding the low grade uh, buried utility information. That quality levels actually start at level D and work their way to level A. Uh, level D is basically somebody saying, hey, there's a utility buried out in that street. It's basically verbal information given to you to say, I think there's something out there. Uh, that's the first step. The next step would be level C, where you actually have record drawing, some other information, which gives you a better indication where that utility is buried in the ground. The next step is level B, and where we're using geophysics information uh, to actually help identify and pinpoint the location of that line in the ground. And the final step is quality level A, where we're actually exposing those buried utilities through vacuum excavation methods, test holes, uh, ways to actually verify and determine where those locations are on the ground. And as you, as you can see, the, as the cost goes up, uh, the level of risk uh, also changes as well. So if you want to decrease your level of risk, you want to go towards quality level A. And for purposes of this project, uh, Capital Region Water made the decision at the beginning that they wanted to concentrate the entire system as a quality level B. So they did geophysics information to identify the locations of the line within six inches of its XY location throughout the entire city. And that is both on the water lines as well as the services. And then at random locations, uh, they did approximately uh, 225 test holes to actually verify that information that they found. So they did uh, actually toward the road or if it was in the grass, did vacuum excavation uh, to expose those utilities. Uh, here on this slide, uh, McKim Creek, as Howard mentioned, was the partner selected for performance work. And in this image here, uh, they primarily used electromagnetic locating to determine the locations of all the water mains and services. And the reason for that is most of the mains in CRW's system are either cast or ductile iron. So this type of technology was putting electric current through those lines uh, is very beneficial. If you're working with plastic pipe, uh, unless there's a conductive uh, tracing line or something like that, this type of technology will not work. Uh, in areas where they would lose the signal or need to verify that information, they can also use ground penetrate radar uh, to actually get signals below the surface. And uh, here, uh, just representing um, with the GPR, that they're running the utilities below the ground to help identify those locations. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we have the vacuum excavation rig, where they're actually exposing those utilities. Uh, for the uh, vacuum excavation, uh, after they expose the utility, they recorded information that could be uh, actually input into the GIS database. And they recorded the depth of the line the size, the material, as well as its uh, general condition. I uh, recorded all that on a test hole data sheet that in the database you can actually click on that test hole that was surveyed and uh, that information will pop up. In addition, for the fuel crews purposes, they, actually, they also input all that information onto these marker bolts. So with the locating device, um, the fuel crews have a uh, locator in this area, they can use their locating device, pull up the information, record it, or, and read uh, the actual information at that location in the future as well. And basically, they're just plastic balls with an RFID reader inside and then uh, an antifreeze float. So basically, when this gets dropped in, this levels itself, and it's good for, I think it's a minimum of 30 plus years. It's really pretty slick in here. These run anywhere from about eight to $15 a pop. Uh, buying the bulk out of the a cheaper, but uh, CRW now has them. Um, their operation staff using them, so as they go out and uh, fix a few repairs in the system, they're actually carrying those with them and dropping them elsewhere as they're completing the repairs. Um, as Howard mentioned, uh, the pink paint uh, was representative of all the designation efforts that were performed as part of this project.
and all those pink paint locations uh, were surveyed by HRG. So we couldn't create it going through, designated all the information, and then HRG came back through and actually surveyed all that there's basically, data collection. Yeah, there's basically two parts to it with the SUE process. You've got the designate and the locate. So the designate is to mark it on the ground, find out where it is, and then the locate. Um, we did all the location. With this project, we collected over 140,000 survey accurate locations. So that's X, Y, Z, to the sub-centimeter accuracy. Um, across the entire area, okay? A lot of that information we also use and we provided it back to the base mapper, uh, T3 that I mentioned earlier, to actually be able to do and, and tighten up their surface model that was created from the aerial photography. So there was a kind of a two-part piece to that. So all the information we had, we could check with theirs. What they had, they could check with ours. Um, the other thing that we're actually using now and CRW is using now, is everybody, everybody recognize that little blue feature there down in the corner? The old wonderful RGIS Online collector app. Um, a lot of the information we've collected and we've used throughout this process, and Matt will talk a little bit further, um, we use directly from RGIS. So we coordinated all our field crews, internal, external, uh, with CRW and with McKinley Creed throughout this entire process, using web applications, Esri based products. And the Army Corps is actually still using a web application right now for the stormwater uh, identification that they're doing. And one of the first things that we put in place for CRW was, for everybody's, anybody's a resident here, the water meter battery replacement. Uh, that was before we even finished the pro or project. Uh, they wanted to be able to get this up and running. Uh, it was a very um, hot topic to be able to figure out what was replaced, what wasn't replaced, what needs to be replaced, and correlate all that together so we were able to quick, put a quick application together to be able to track the internal use for that uh, water meter battery replacement. Um, I mentioned about the online. This is a progress reporting map that we used to do. Um, we did everything from the printouts that we do at the meetings to what you see up in the right hand corner or to the bottom right hand corner. These were the designated sheets. Basically, it was a multi tier process where we would go through. Um, McKim and Creed would designate it, they would sketch it, we would shoot it, survey it, any questions would be fed back through. All these were then rescanned and put directly into the, uh, the online GIS application. And then anybody could access it. They had PM project managers for McKim and Creed who were based out of Florida and or North Carolina, as well as some locals. So they used our web application to stay in um, contact with everybody as the process moved along. At the end of the day, this map doesn't look like this anymore. Basically, what the colors said was whether it was complete, whether it was surveyed, whether it was needed to be designated, whether it hadn't been visited yet, or whether it was GIS complete. This is all green now. Um, all this has been turned over. Um, but this was how we kept basically the status of how things were going uh, for about 18 to 24 months. So that was the water system. On the sewer system, the first uh, item that CRW wanted to tackle was their interceptors. And the interceptors are the main pipes that, the large diameter pipes that collect all the wastewater and combined sewer water uh, throughout the city and surrounding area and convey that to the wastewater treatment plant. There are um, five or six uh, interceptors uh, throughout the uh, 40 system, and they range anywhere in size from 24 inches in diameter up to 60 inches in diameter. And the tools that were determined to be utilized early on in the process was a multi-system inspection of the uh, interceptors. And the multi-system inspection included uh, sonar, sonar investigation, uh, so to collect any of the data below the water level, laser profiling to collect data above the water level, and then CCTV, so actually above the water level as well, you're getting a video image. And with this, um, CRW put out the proposals and selected Red Zone Robotics to perform these services on approximately 70,000 feet of pipe. And uh, if you want to back real quick? Yes, sir. Um, basically, the tool that Red Zone utilized uh, for the majority of their work uh, was this unit here. It's a float system that has a sonar unit on the bottom, a laser unit up top, and in the front of it, there's uh, the CCTV equipment. And all that information is compiled and combined actually into one document or report that's actually giving you um, 
picture above the water level, and then the laser profiling allows you to see, compare what the original pipe dimensions were versus where it is now. And is there sediment buildup? Is there pipe wall loss? Is there holes in the pipe? Or perhaps even uh, tuberculation occurring where the pipe size is shrinking. Uh, this is uh, one of the reports on the Paxton Creek Interceptor uh, that was performed. And in this report here, uh, Paxton Creek Interceptor is generally this triangle shape. And the data shows um, the bottom uh, has a V shape to it. But there was debris buildup found in the bottom of the pipe as captured from the sonar information to show debris levels going down through the pipe. Uh, in addition, the laser information uh, picked up going through the pipe, buried manholes that were identified. So uh, going through the process, we anticipated approximately 200 manholes uh, that would need to be investigated as part of the interceptor work. In completing it, we found that there was actually 250 actual manholes installed. So those other 50 are buried manholes that did not exist on the drawings. And, and this is one of the lines where there's actually two of them within about 10 feet of each other. Um, and the information shows uh, here basically that these buried manholes are capped not far above the actual pipe itself. Uh, the information that red zone collects can actually be split along the pipeline and laid flat, which is represented here. So you can take a quick glance at the report for each segment of pipe put together at once to get a real uh, quick determination of the condition of the pipe. The blue lines uh, indicate the level of sediment on the bottom of the pipe. And so the blue indicates where the dimensions that were recorded were less than uh, what the pipe itself uh, was, the dimensions were supposed to be. And the red indicates the dimensions measured are greater than what they were supposed to be. And this is sitting fine in the very manholes discovered. For the manholes, uh, COW also wanted to collect uh, information on the interceptor manholes as well. And manhole investigation can occur a couple different ways. Uh, it can just be from the surface where somebody's looking down the manhole and recording information that they can see. You can also drop a handheld camera down to help you uh, investigate that as well. Um, you can do uh, manned entries to record the information, but for this project, CRW uh, selected to utilize a digital manual optical scanner. Uh, this is a unit that uh, basically will fit on the back of the pickup truck as well as uh, the altar locations where you can alter the Kubota. And basically, uh, this is a data collection uh, unit just with a reel here, but uh, all the brains are being, uh, brains in the system are here. There's a camera top and bottom that uh, is collecting both imagery as well as LIDAR uh, data uh, for the manual that's loaded down in and collected. And CRW is selected to use this for, again, the 200 and some manuals as part of this project. Uh, this is the data uh, of one of the manuals uh, on the CRW system. It's actually on Front Street, uh, for the Front Street Interceptor. And as I mentioned, the, laid, the LIDAR collection data, uh, if you look at the picture on the far right, um, the manhole itself uh, is not a typical manhole. Generally, there are straight barrel sections going up through the manhole and you just have the cone top at the, uh, at the top of the manhole for your access point. Uh, what we found here is a lot of these manholes on the front street are the mushroom shape, um, which is great information for collecting from this future engineering purpose. It allows you to identify the square footage involved if you're going to be doing rehab work, or if you do have to get in here allows you to determine uh, what special tools and materials you may need at some point in the future for maintenance purposes. Uh, we also collected data, or video, or imagery data uh, with this. And just like the pipes were split along the 12 o'clock position, or 6 o'clock position, the manholes are split vertically as well and laid flat. So in this manhole here, on the uh, upstream side, we actually had a circular pipe coming in. And then on the downstream side, changed into a rectangular box pipe leaving. And we also had two pipe connections coming in as well. Um, so with the manual optical scanner, uh, again, we have a lot of data collected for purposes of maintenance in the future. And this is also being done to prioritize the condition of each system. Um, overall, CRW has, as I said, about 70,000 feet of interceptor and about 700,000 feet of sewer pipe. Uh, plans as we move forward in the future to go out into the distribution of that 700,000 feet 
collect information and help prioritize where they need to uh, look at first for repair and investigation technology. Um, so with that, going out into the collection system, there's some other tools and uh, robots that can be utilized. Um, I know there's been a couple media reports on uh, robots invading Harrisburg sewers, and that was being done during the uh, interceptor investigation. As we move into the smaller diameter pipes, uh, there's some other tools. Uh, here is one often by Red Zone Robotics. It's their solo unit. It's actually an autonomous robot that does data collection. So it's pre-programmed by the operator, drops into a manhole and pushes start to let it go, and it has a bunch of sensors and everything else, uh, collects the data, comes back, and when it's finished, it sends the, uh, can send the operator a text message saying, hey, I'm finished. Other ones are tethered units uh, that the operators control as they go through the pipes for data collection. And uh, these can be outfitted primarily with uh, CCTV as well as some laser information. The unit on the right is actually um, a unit produced by Resin as well. That's for large diameter pipes, uh, 120 inches if not larger. And uh, that can actually collect uh, LiDAR information in the pipe as well to determine uh, if we're going to be rehabbing these large pipes and there's bends in the pipes. You can actually plot the coordinates of those pipelines and collect that information to help you with the rehab work in the future. Uh, just some examples of some videos that these uh, units collect that uh, see some TV outputs uh, to determine the condition of the pipelines you're going after. Along with what Matt was saying, of course, all this is going into a great database, which is going to be connected to GIS. So the days of old where you'd have a VHS tape sitting on a shelf somewhere that an engineer may look at one time is now going to be day-to-day -day data that they can use in the office and in the field directly, directly through their GIS system. One of the other nice things that we're looking at for the collection side is a newer technology called these gyroscopic mapping probes. Um, basically what this does is you can tie it to the, one of those little machines that we showed you here before. Use it as a tether to it and as it pulls it through and does the CCTV, I can also now get true XYZ coordinates of where my pipes are. So today's systems, yeah, it's manhole to manhole, it's a straight run, should be a consistent slope. Um, obviously in the older systems that's always not the case. Um, Really, in the evenings, especially in stormwater systems, that's not the case. So it's nice to be able to put these types of probes in the ground when you've got a very precise um, X, Y, Z on the surface. I can then program it to figure out the depth based upon the uh, LIDAR information that's being collected for the manholes. Program this to run it down the line. At the end of the day, I come back and I get this wonderful three-dimensional map of where that actual is at. So there's no more guess anymore of above ground and below ground. We know right where it is. And all this feeds into a three-dimensional GIS, not just a 2D, this is a pretty picture where my system is. Now I can actually use this information. I can engineer upon it. I can do capacity studies. I can do rehab. It's, it's basically all the information that you've always wanted to know without ever knowing. So now you've got it, and you can use it more than just saying, okay, when there's a break, what do I do? I can actually plan and work with it. So where does this all go? I stole this from a measuring slide, so hopefully there's no one measuring here. Um, we're a business partner with measuring, so I hope they're going to be too upset with us. But um, basic platform. You know, you've got the centralized database. It's going to be used for everything, from you know the actual workers in the field using tablet PCs and cell phones, um, to potential contractors, public engagement, which is already underway as we speak, um, enterprise integration. They are integrating many systems together. You've got your GIS, you've got your Red Zone, which is providing um, engineering grade information back to you. It's going to be in the asset management systems. It's been discussed to tie it into document management systems such as OnBase, to tie it into their Tyler um, financial systems for their billing. So it's not just one piece or two pieces. This is the true enterprise level system of what CRW has literally went from. Well, pre-Civil War to well into the 21st, 22nd century. And not just above ground. They're, they've taken it a step further than, well, what most utilities do. Um, with the investigation techniques that we're talking about and the types of technologies that we're putting in place and working with them on to be able to do this investigation, they're getting information that 
any normal utility is not going to get. They understand the need of the understanding of their systems to be able to provide you know, better quality information and better quality service to the, their customers. So through their GIS, they're being able to do this. We talked about the infrastructure. Of course, there's hardware and software involved. Um, they're running true enterprise level SDE. They have uh, a license agreement with Esri to be able to basically implement at will when they need it. Um, they have ELA, obviously enterprise level ELA in place. Um, they're implementing RTS online. They're, you know, like I said, they work with Azure, they work with Philips, they're working with CityWorks as their selected asset management system. Um, they literally went from nothing to the Cadillac in a very short period of time. Um, they took off some very big bites and they've still got a lot of bites left to go, but they're definitely heading in an enormous positive direction. And uh, if you have any questions, like I said, I could do hours on every one of these different slides. Um, but that kind of kind of brings us to the end. Again, I'll throw this slide up there again. You'll see a lot of the discussions of why I threw that up there. But that's kind of the development process that we've gone through. How much did this cost? Millions. I'm not going to show the code. Um, and there's probably going to be more millions to go. Um, it's been a multi-year process. But the amount of information that's being gathered, you really, it's really hard to put a price on. Um, when you look at the amount of time and downtime that was there just with that one single water line break, there was multi million loss just because of that. So it's really a drop in the bucket when you really look at what's being invested versus the information that's coming out of this that's going to be usable for basically years to come. And with the asset management in place, it's going to be able to allow them to try to basically get ahead of that and make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, a lot of the discussion in the past as well as everybody talks about sinkholes. Um, one of the things we've been trying to do as well is use the GIS information along with GHD and some other engineers to be able to see where the mapping is, see what the conditions are, to be able to potentially predict where the sinkholes potentially could be. There's no there's exact science in that. Because um, the sinkholes is more as a result of the utility. Yes. A utility collapse, not necessarily the voids. We've looked at um, other collection techniques, the internal GPR. People talk about surface GPR. One of the uh, technologies that Matt and I were talking about the other day is GPR internal to pipes. So to find uh, voids on the external pipes, where that, those potential voids could be from the internal out to the out external in. Um, they've been, CRW has been very, very proactive in, in using the technologies that are available in the correct ways to be able to get a better answer. Can, can you see this? Uh in pipe stuff to get the uh, uh, thickness of the pipe, looking for weak spots, that kind of thing? It's, uh, it's technology that's being developed. Uh, okay. I believe you can get a look at that and see. Uh, I look at the specifics for the manufacturers and the pipe materials and the uh, big components that they have. Um, one of the things CRW is looking at at some point in the future is a condition, condition assessment on the primary transmission of the water system. Uh, and there's um, other technologies that are out there besides the impact of GDR to help identify the condition of those pipelines that are being evaluated. One of the things that they've, they've shown in the manholes as well as in the pipes with those LIDAR, we've got to be able to see the actual um, shapes of the pipes and the shapes of the manholes themselves. If you have good enough as -built information about what those were supposed to be when they were originally designed, you can look at this information and extract you know, basically what kind of deterioration has taken place. Um, to potentially find weak spots, to find you know, things that could potentially happen. Um, but that's one of the things that the red zone is doing is when if they're doing these pipes and finding this information out, you can actually see where the, the wall thinness has changed, where the sedimentation has, has set. Um, so yes, I mean, that's all the engineering that comes into play with. Did you, uh, did you find Jimmy Hoffa or anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't find Jimmy Hoffa, but uh, we did almost pull uh, enough parts out of enough parts out of the sewer to build a car. We found um, near the scrapyard, uh, we found axles, uh, bumpers, bumpers. I mean, there was lots of debris built up in there. Did you 
You sell it back to them. <laughs> right? uh, so you're They're paying for it. So. <laughs> and like I said, I did mention you know the continuation of this project. Army Corps is still involved. They're still doing uh, investigations specifically for the MS4 areas to begin with. Um, so they're using this technology and information we've gathered to date to be able to go out and, and pretty much identify areas of concern and areas within the, the stormwater systems. And you know, there's there's been things that have been found, everything from units that have been full to pipes, connections that are questioned, um, to be able to basically paint a better picture of, of a system that they really didn't know was there. Um, one of the, I always love to tell this one story, and I, I have to bring it up. Matt mentioned about finding 50 extra man -ups. When we first started this project, one of the things that we talked about, the public works director at the time that came in and said that they had just found a new manhole after a storm because a tree fell over. And I said, well, what does that have to do? And he said, well, the tree actually grew over top of the manhole and they never knew it was there. And so the tree grew up enough, died, and fell over, and then they found a manhole underneath that tree. So that just kind of tells you some of the things that CRW had to basically take on themselves in order to be able to, because at the beginning of this project, CRW did not own all these systems. I guess that's something we should bring up. Um, the, the city owned pieces of it. Um, DHA owned pieces of it. And through the processes over the last two years, CRW now owns and operates these systems. But it was not theirs to begin with. So they've had to bite off this big piece that was really never theirs to begin with as far as their operating system. What's that? So they own the water, but they contracted with the city for operation. Any other questions? Um, are you guys doing, because I know that there were a couple, sing, or a couple, there were a lot of singles in the city. Are you guys the ones that are going to be doing the mapping for that? Or is that? Actually, we have another consultant. Okay. I didn't know if that was going to be integrated with this or if that was going to end up. Well, they're using separate. all this information. Okay. All the GIS that we collected, they're using that. Okay. So I was thinking that that would probably be a good, Good data Yeah, one thing with this is it's not just collect once, use once, it's been collect once and we've used it for a lot of different things so far. So and it will continue in the future. So there's time we got left. Did we kill the whole hour? Hopefully we didn't put anybody to sleep. Thank you. Thank you all very much.